Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, actually, I guess. I'm Karen Modaleski, and I'm delighted to help bring you this webinar on mold prevention and remediation. This week's free webinars celebrate the inaugural ALA and Elects Preservation Week, which is an initiative of partners that include the Library of Congress, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the Society of American Archivists, and others. If your organization has not participated in Preservation Week this year, we really hope you'll join the roughly 85 organizations across the country who did by doing one thing, however small, to strengthen our public's knowledge of preservation's importance for our information and cultural collections. Alex would like to thank the HF Group of Chesterland, Ohio, for supporting Alex webinars during Preservation Week, making it possible to offer this important topic free of charge. Our speaker today is Michelle Brown, who graduated from the Camberwell School of Arts in London with a certificate in handbook binding and restoration. Michelle is a conservator in private practice and is also a book conservator at Cornell University's libraries, where she's been since 1995. She's also enrolled in the University of Alabama Distance MLIS program and expects her diploma in August of 2010. Congratulations, Michelle. Extensive workshop experience is one of her, uh, is one of her uh, expertises, and she has focused especially on the care and handling of collections, disaster preparedness, and mold issues, all very important to our care of collections. Please use the question box to ask questions. We will accept questions throughout, but due to the large number of participants, we have 615 of you registered. Answers will be provided at the end or recorded and deferred until after the webinar, when they'll be sent out electronically. We'll now switch to Michelle and let her begin her presentation. Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen, I hope? Um, I want to thank everybody for joining me today, uh, for joining all of us. I also want to say that this image has nothing to do with mold, although there are, there are probably mold spores in the picture. This is actually an image of me at a parchment making workshop, and I'm holding a skin before uh, you pin it out and scrape it. All right, this is what uh, we'll be talking about today. Uh, I want to examine exactly what mold is, and then we'll talk about how to prevent it from growing in our collections and how to remove it if we, get, if we do have it. All right, mold is not uh, part of the, even though it looks green and plant-like, mold is not part of the plant kingdom. It is actually part of the kingdom of fungi. The kingdom of fungi includes uh, yeasts, molds and mushrooms, and we're more concerned with molds because they are what affect library materials. Molds isn't actually a scientific term. Um, they aren't uh, part of a distinct group, but they are included in several phyla. I'm bringing up these characteristics because sometimes people talk about disinfecting a collection as though it has a bacterial infection. But molds are much more complex than that. They have a nucleus uh, along with other complex structures. And they're actually more similar to animals than uh, they are to plants. This contributes to the difficulty in killing them, uh, as opposed to bacteria, which is really just a, a bunch of DNA enclosed by a cell wall. One source I found describes them in this way, um, and if we ignore the plant-like comment of them, uh, Molds are, consist of long filaments that digest materials and absorb it. And this is a part of the problem for heritage materials. Molds digest their host or substrate, and then they ingest or absorb the nutrients. Uh, and they are found everywhere. Basically, they require organic or carbon-containing compounds for sustenance. And cellulose, which we know is found in library materials, is a great source of carbon. So I'm going to show you some examples of uh, wild and crazy mold. Uh, this first one is a fungus that's actually killing um, a locust. Uh, I kind of like this one because it's sort of scary. It's uh, actually killing the locust and not just scavenging the carcass. And this is mold growing on maple syrup. 
And what's unusual about this is that uh, maple syrup is being composed of sugar doesn't actually have a lot of free water, and yet this mold is able to um, to grow where there is no water, uh, in effect getting moisture from the air. And this is powdery mildew. We often refer to mildew when we talk about mold, but in general, uh, official or scientific mildew occurs outside, and it's another form of mold. And although you do find this on your plants in the summer, it generally does not harm them. And as you can see, nothing is safe from mold. Mold grows on inorganic materials. It will grow on latex paint. This is mold growing on my PVA. Um, you can see the, the green fuzzy parts are the mold spores. Sometimes molds are delicious. So in this picture, we have uh, cheese with a red mold crust and Stilton blue cheese. And this is brie cheese, and the white is the mold forming the crust that, that uh, we eat quite readily. This is salami that's been injected with penicillium for added flavor and to retard spoilage. And this is cheese with truffles. Now. Um, <clears throat> Uh, truffles aren't a mold exactly, but they're still part of the fungus kingdom. So all substrates can support mold. Living and dead materials, uh, living and dead plant matter. You find mold inside and on our bodies. Inside our bodies, it might be in the form of uh, aspergillosis. Or gelosis. Uh, you find it as athlete's foot, ringworm. We find molds everywhere. And I, I'm bringing this up because it just shows how difficult it can be to kill molds. And of course, molds can be beneficial. They work to kill bacteria and eliminate waste. All right, these are the components of mold. All right, the vegetative phase of mold includes the hypha or the stalks that are sent up once a spore has germinated. That forms a mycelium or colony of stalks, and it's at that point that you can probably start to see mold. These stalks then form conidiophores or specialized stalks that produce the spores. And although the individual parts may not be visible to the naked eye, together they form a colony that does become visible. And this is, an, this is a, uh, as you can see, a germinating spore just after 24 hours. And I've taken this from a book by uh, Mary Lou Florian called The Heritage Eaters. And uh, quite a bit of the information I'm using for this workshop I got from her two books, as well as her articles. OK, as the, um, as the mycelium or the colony grows, the hypha actually eat their way down into the substrate. And as they do that, they release digestive enzymes, which causes a lot of the staining that you can see on heritage materials. They also release toxins. And these toxins um, protect the colony from encroachment by other organisms. At, at this point in this vegetative state, the colony is fairly fragile. And if moisture is withdrawn, or if the temperature is lowered sufficiently, the colony will shrivel up and perhaps die or just sort of hibernate. But that particular area has been permanently weakened and is susceptible to another invasion uh, by another mold spore, or if the, uh, say, the moisture content increases, the colony can start growing again. And this is a, a good representation, I think, of the development of the mycelium from a single spore. And this is another one of Florian's images of a colony about 48 hours after germination. And so at this point, you can see it would be visible. And you can see that if you do have a spike uh, in humidity or a leak, you really don't have a lot of time to do something about it. These are various molds uh, on the surface of a pumpkin. The white areas are the, the mycelium or mycelia. And the green areas are the conidiophores. Those are the stalks holding the spores ready to be released. 
uh, and I, I want to get back to the, the Conidia four, which I said earlier are the specialized stock that produce spores. This is a single conidia four on an aspergillus mold. Uh, and at this point I want to thank um, a lot of these images I got from uh, Professor Kathy Hodge who works, who is a professor in the plant pathology department here at Cornell. And she has a, a great blog for those of you who enjoy blogging um, called the Mushroom Blog. And she has a lot of microscopic images and other images of molds and fungi. So in this uh, picture, you can see the stalk. Let me see if my thing works. Here's the stalk. And these are the spores attached around it. And these are single spores that are, have been released. OK, so the, the attachment of the conidia uh, to the conidia spores pretty much varies by genus. The top one is a, an example of the aspergillus family. And it was categorized in 1729 by a monk who thought the arrangement looked like an aspergillomer, or holy water sprinkler. The uh, bottom one is penicillium. And you can see how that has more of a chain. The spores are attached in the chain formation. And this is another view of hypha and conidia spores from an aspergillus mold. It doesn't look quite like the drawing, but you can see how the spores are arranged around the stalk. And this is a view of penicillium under a microscope. So I want to talk about the spores, which are the uh, reproductive phase. And this is the phase that's really difficult to kill. It's fairly easy to get rid of the vegetative phase, but the spores uh, remain around for a long time. Although they don't cause physical damage, they're the cause of the creation and the spread of mold colonies. And due to their microscopic skies, size, excuse me, they are easily inhaled and are a source of allergic irritation and to toxic effects. And this is a microscopic view of the spores from that truffle cheese I showed earlier. And this is a slide showing mold spores mixed with pollen. And in, if you compare them to pollen, their small size is very apparent. I'm going to use my cursor. These are mold spores. These are pollen spores. Um, and so you can see how it's practically impossible to remove mold spores from uh, from an entire air supply. The mold spores can actually range in um, diameter from 1 to 100 microns, which is a micron is a millionth of a meter. And many mold spores are between 2 and 20 microns. OK, these are the stages of a life of a spore. When a spore matures, it's released from the conidia spore. And at this time, it's in a dormant state. But it contains food, and it contains toxins. Basically, everything it needs to start a new colony. However, it has to be activated in order for it to germinate. And different things can cause activation, it, fluctuating temperature or humidity, uh, various chemicals, or landing on a substrate that's rich in carbon. At any rate, once it becomes active, the cell walls will then become thin, and it will prepare to germinate. And this is mold growing out of flax fiber. And you can see how, the, um, how it's, really, it's really breaking, starting to break apart the fiber as it grows. And I like this um, particular illustration. Because it shows what's, what's going on beneath the surface. You can see these are the hypha. These are the spores being released. It's connected uh, between the hypha and below. So even though you can remove this on top, but the, it has already grown into the area below and digested this area. And you may notice there's sort of a difference in terminology. These are called sporangiophores in this picture. Uh, and that's just really related to um, the difference between species and how the spores are produced. But for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm just going to keep calling them spores and um, conidia spores. So this is a diagram that pretty much sun, sums up the mold life cycle. Spores germinate, form the mycelium, 
form specialized stalks that release more spores, which then go into the air. It's important for, um, especially for removing mold, to distinguish between active and inactive mold colonies. Active mold smears and is not easily removed. Uh, when the mold colony is inactive, it can be removed just by with a, a vacuum cleaner, uh, especially a HEPA vacuum cleaner, or some sort of static cloth. And if you are going to attempt removal, you have to wait until it becomes inactive. Now, <clears throat> the mold I showed earlier on the um, maple syrup is, was, is known as a xerophilic mold, which means a mold that is dry loving or it can live on a substrate with very low water activity because it actually extracts moisture from the air. Hydrophilic molds, on the other hand, need a surface with continual free moisture. And two of the uh, common mold, indoor molds that are xerophilic are aspergillus and penicillium. And you can expect both of these molds to grow when the relative humidity exceeds 70% for several days. Although it's better to maintain even a lower RH of say 40 or 50%. Once you get up to 60 and heading towards 70, you have to start looking for mold growth. It's also important to remember that although an RH indicator might give you a measurement for the area of a room, there might be dead spots in that room, um, areas where there's not good air circulation. And particularly in places where library materials are stored that you know, have shelves with um, closed off area, if the air is still, the humidity in that area might be quite a bit higher. Therefore, uh, good air circulation is really important for preventing mold growth, if only because it helps spores from landing and germinating. And this is an aspergillus colony growing on the edge of a paperback novel. Now, the hydrophilic molds tend to be more toxic, and they're molds that need a very moist substrate. The most toxic one is the first one, the stachybotrys. And that's found on wet building materials, particularly on insulation behind finished walls. And that's had quite a bit of press, especially in the southwest, where that's been a, a real problem, because um, it can cause major neurological damage. Cladosporium uh, can be found on wet wood. You probably would find that in your bathroom, for example, on a wet window frame. And the catomium is um, also found in wet areas. And that's a, a little more dangerous, because that's suspected of being an immune um, system suppressant. And that's found on wet paper, such as sheetrock paper. Although this is an image of that on a paperback novel. And this is the stachybotrys, and it even looks really evil. But these are the most, four of the, the common molds that you would run across. Um, Aspergillus is found in soil and plant debris and house dust. And penicillium is found nearly everywhere. It's also a low temperature mold, so you might find that growing on food in your refrigerator. The uh, catom catomium is a strong decomposer of cellulose, so you'll find it there. And I think it's important to mention for the penicillium mold that if you are allergic to the drug penicillin, then you are probably allergic to penicillium, other penicillium molds, which would be important if you're going to undertake some sort of cleanup. And at this point, I want, to make, I want to take a moment to talk about book lice, but it's kind of hard to see them there. This is about how big they are. Perhaps you've seen them. I'm embarrassed to say I've seen them in my house, but that's a better view. And they're actually an indicator uh, of mold. They eat the fungal hypha, and they indicate that mold's growing in your collection. I haven't found any literature that says that they actually eat the cellulose of the paper. They're just after the hypha. So if you see these, um, first you have to be worried about your collections, and the next thing to do would be to lower the humidity. And foxing. Foxing is also a form of mold in paper. Uh, some earlier literature says that it's uh, related to iron spots in paper. Um, Florian 
says the cause is all mold. It's probably mold that's been introduced during the paper making process. Either way, high humidity also makes it worse. And the stains are permanent. You can take a book apart and bleach it, but they, these foxing stains will usually come back. So to summarize <clears throat> this part of the presentation, um, mold outbreaks occur when mold spores, of which there are millions in the air we breathe, are able to settle in one spot in dust and germinate. And this will occur if the relative humidity gets high enough, usually above 70 degrees for several days. Now the nature of your materials will also affect this because some materials have inherently a higher moisture content than others. For example, leathers are probably have a higher moisture content than papers. But nonetheless, um, high humidity in dusty materials will usually lead to a mold outbreak. Now let's see, I, this is a, let's just see how mold grows on this book. Hopefully it'll work. The, um, the thing that's interesting about this particular presentation is uh, this was a book that was suspended in water and injected with uh, pink shelf mushroom spores. And while they grew slowly, um, all this other material on the top and the sides grew, even without the, without the, you know, having been injected. And so this shows what happens just with having spores in the air. And this material on the bottom here um, are mycelia. And these materials up here are some of the aspergillus molds that I showed earlier. And here's the pink shelf mushroom growing. OK, so let's move on to the effects of mold on library materials. I think most of us have seen the effects of mold growth on library materials. But I want to emphasize that the damage is permanent because the materials are actually digested by the mold. This is a book that uh, came into our conservation lab. And you can see that um, it's stained, probably from the digestive enzymes. And here's also staining from mold. And it's extremely thin at the bottom edges. So the only way you can really treat a book like this, even after you've removed the mold, is to actually um, provide a support for the paper by backing it with a, a, another thin paper. This is an example of inactive mold. Um, and you can see there's like a water stain, and it grew all along the water stain. And the way I treat mold like this is to wipe it with uh, isopropyl, 70% isopropyl alcohol using cheesecloth to just wipe off the extra spores. Um, and Alcohol will kill mold if you're able to soak it for about 10 minutes. Unfortunately, once it's treated, this is how it looks after treatment. Um, so I guess I, I'm sorry. I see the video didn't work, so sorry about that. Um, anyway, it was great. Um, so here you can see the mold spores were, in effect, um, it's a, it's a permanent discoloration, even though the, the mold spores are gone. OK, the, and the other thing it's important to remind us of is that it's important to remind us of the health effects related to mold exposure. Active spores and hypha can cause allergic or toxic reactions, depending on the species. And it's particularly important um, to people with suppressed immune systems or that have asthma. There's been uh, some discussion as to whether or not inactive spores still affect people. But if you, um, as I said, are, if you're allergic to the drug penicillin, you should be extra careful when cleaning up any indoor mold um, because penicillin is a common genus found in library materials. And you just can't tell when people are going to have um, uh, Affects you know be affected by either live mold or inactive mold. This is an interesting book that actually uh, explores that further. Um, this author relates this, the symptoms of witchcraft possession to fungal infection by rye, 
And this idea was first introduced in 1976 by a, an author named Linda Caporell. But Matosian actually expands this thesis to include um, all of Europe and traces um, sort of the use of rye by primarily peasants. Um, so anyway, it, it's an interesting thing to consider. All right, so now we understand how mold grows, um, but how, how do we keep it out of our collections? And basically, it's by practicing, giving, a, giving your collections a good environment, practicing good housekeeping, and taking care and acquiring new materials. So the proper environment is really low humidity. And I'm going to say between 40 and 50% relative humidity. Uh, I know there's a lot of discussion about this. And the humidity is really related to the temperature that you're keeping your materials at. And so that's, I think, a discussion um, for another workshop. But um, good air circulation is also important. Um, because basically, if a, if a mold spore never lands on a substrate, it will eventually just use up its met metabolic reserves and die. So keeping good air circulation is a good way to at least inhibit mold growth. By good housekeeping, I mean to try to keep dust off your materials. I really like using static cloths uh, for removing dust, making sure that they haven't been treated with any kind of perfume um, or coatings. Uh, vacuuming with a HEPA vacuum cleaner, which is a high efficiency particulate air um, cleaner that has an enclosed filtration system, will work. It's really important to not bring moldy materials into your collection, which I know sometimes can be difficult to avoid because you're, you know, a lot of libraries are acquiring donated material. One thing that'll help is if you can establish a staging area for examining new materials and just making it clear to your donors that if they keep their materials in the basement, you may not accept them. Um, so, okay, so you found some mold in your collection and you have to decide how you're going to approach it. The first thing you have to do is assess whether or not uh, it's a small enough outbreak for you to even handle. Usually my rule of thumb, if it's more than 100 to 200 books, that you have to start thinking about just sending that out to a mold remediation company. If you are going to handle it yourself, uh, you need to acquire personal protective equipment. Um, we get a lot of our supplies from a company called Lab Safety Supply, but I think any lab or building supply company can give you these items. Uh, I recommend nitrile gloves, which are often blue, uh, because they don't contain latex, which can cause allergies, and they don't have any powders associated with them, and they're relatively comfortable for handling materials, and they resist chemicals. Uh, you don't want to use cloth gloves because they can be abrasive, and they will transfer spores um, to other materials. And you want to use non-vented goggles because they offer better eye protection because the sides are closed. If you're dealing with a, a, enough mold, you want to consider wearing uh, a respirator. These are two types of disposable respirators. The, you want to make sure it's an N95 respirator. You can see in the corner here, it says N95. That means that they will pick up 95% of any particles that are larger than 0.3 microns. The N means that they're not resistant to oils, which is, is irrelevant for mold removal. It's important to remember that people with facial hair will not get a good fit for a respirator. And if, you're, if you are going to start using respirators, ideally you should be fitted professionally by uh, if you happen to have an environmental health department or you can go to a local hospital. And you should have some undergo a stress test to make sure you can deal with the lack of oxygen that comes with wearing a mask for any period of time. Okay, and these are examples of sort of full face and half face face respirators, and the same um, caveats apply to that. People with facial hair won't get a good fit. And here's a mold cleanup crew showing off their personal protective equipment. But what they're lacking are gloves. If you're going to handle mold, especially, you need to have gloves. And here they're all working. And you can see, they, in addition to the gloves and the suits and the hats, they have uh, booties. Because if you're going to work around mold, you want to be able to take um, all of your protective 
supplies off and basically throw them away. You don't, you have to be concerned with tracking extra mold spores around your facility or even to your house. So um, before working, you've got your equipment and you're all set up and you want to isolate your effective, affected items. So you can first establish a quarantine area, which can be another room. And ideally, that room should have some sort of directional airflow with the air moving away from you and out of a window or, or something like that. You don't want to just blow air around using a fan. If you can't do that, you can drape plastic around the whole area to kind of seal it off away from um, the rest of the library or the institution. You don't necessarily want to use a fume hood either because mold spores can gather up in the ductwork. If it's available, you could use a, a biohazard cabinet for cleaning uh, off spores from individual uh, books. And this is an example of, you know, you can put up sheets of plastic to um, separate that area. Meanwhile, while you're doing this, you have to deactivate the mold growth. And you do that by lowering the humidity. And you can do that with dehumidifiers. Um, I'm a sometimes, oh, you know, people wonder if you should use a fan. I'm a little worried about using a fan because then you're blowing all these extra mold spores around. You do want to have good air circulation. So I, I guess it's uh, using a fan with discretion. And you have to remember that library materials are able to absorb a lot of moisture. And so it might take them a while to, to dry out. But you really should hold off trying to remove mold until it's reached that uh, powdery stage. So removing um, in, uh, inactive mold can be done with the um, HEPA vacuum cleaner I mentioned before, the disposable static cloths, or the dry cleaning sponge. And here's a picture. Um, here's a picture of the vacuum cleaner. The dry cleaning sponge is sometimes known as a soot sponge. Um, I believe Gaylord sells it under the name of dry cleaning sponge, and it um, it's made out of vulcanized rubber. It actually picks up the dirt, and then you, as a surface gets dirty, you sort of cut it until you have a clean surface, and then you eventually throw the whole thing away. And I, I think it's a great way to pick up um, bits of dust and mold. If you wanted to vacuum a single sheet of paper, you can do it by putting it under a screen like this and weighting it down and then vacuuming through the screen. Then um, you can, once the books of the moldy books have been removed, you can clean the area where the outbreak occurred. Um, and to do that, uh, most of the literature recommends using bleach because bleach actually uh, kills the cell or denatures the cell walls. You want to use no more than three quarters of a cup of bleach to one gallon of water. Uh, you can wipe the surface and just let the solution sit there for five minutes. But you have to make sure the air is thoroughly dry before you return materials to it. Also, if the mold has come from an HVAC system, which it often does, the entire HVAC system would have to be cleaned. All of the ductwork would have to be cleaned as well. Then uh, when you're finally, when you're done, you want to discard everything uh, and you'd have to clean all of the, the hose and the attachments of whatever vacuum you used. And finally, you have to monitor your environment environment to make sure that you're uh, maintaining a low relative humidity. Humidity, And if you've had some sort of uh, flood or leak, um, you'd have to use a moisture probe to make sure the carpeting is really dry. It's, sometimes it's difficult to figure that out. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about actually dealing with moldy um, items. This is an example of uh, some, uh, some items we found in the annex. And I think they were probably wet or damp when they were uh, stored because they're labeled damaged. Uh, this has enough fuzzy mold, um, like right here, that I would say these should be discarded. And it may be to, you know, you might say, well, you really need the information. Um, I would be very careful about trying to photocopy um, or scan 
unless it's with an overhead camera, any moldy materials. You could clean the mold spores off using alcohol and cheesecloth, but it, it's still pretty, uh, it's a pretty dicey proposition. So I'd say unless these are the last known copies um, of something that they should just be discarded. But this is a case where probably the mold is only on the top edges where it's been exposed to the air. And one thing you could do in this case would be to just cut off the moldy parts and then scan or photocopy the remaining parts. Sometimes you just can't save it. And this is, this is the kind of book I would say you just have to throw it out. Usually uh, my rule is if you have pages sticking together with mold colonies, um, then it, it has to go. This is a book that's really just uh, severely water stained. It doesn't seem to be moldy. So if you didn't find mold inside the pages, um, I would say you could just take off the cover and rebind it. So this is a terrible picture, but um, it does show there is light mold growth on the covers. So especially with modern uh, library buckram, you could clean, probably clean this off with alcohol using cheesecloth. Um, and once again, I use 70% isopropyl alcohol, dipping the cheesecloth in and wringing it out so it's practically dry, and then just wiping off the covers. The alcohol shouldn't damage the covers, and it'll pick up the mold spores and hypha. And if we do um, treat an item, and then it has to go back into the collection, we'll often put a label like this just to let uh, users know that it has been treated. Uh, and that way, we don't keep getting the same books back saying that um, it has mold, because as we've seen, mold staining is pretty much permanent. So to sum up, uh, for cleaning up, you have to first adjust your environment, get the proper um, equipment, and do whatever it takes to remove uh, any inactive spores. And to prevent future outbreaks, um, you have to keep a low humidity, even lower than 70%, um, dust regularly, and maintain good air circulation in your collections. Now I have some questions that people ask, have asked me quite frequently, and so I'm going to answer those, and then I can take your questions. A lot of people ask, you know, what's mildew? And it's really the same thing as mold, but, um, you know, it's just flatter. It doesn't have, it's not as fuzzy. Sometimes you smell it, but you don't see it, and you often find it on textiles. But it's mold. It's not any different. Um, this is a little tricky. You know, I think you can really smell mold. On the other hand, you have to be careful you're not just smelling uh, red rot or um, old book smell. And then a lot of times you can see it. So that's, and if you can see it in one place, you probably have it in other places. And the mold will actually start developing in 24 hours. If you have a leak or a spike in humidity, you probably have between two and four days before you, you will start getting mold. And will it infect the rest of your collection? Well, you certainly can tr you know, transfer a lot of spores from moldy materials to clean materials. On the other hand, mold growth is directly related to your environment. But you don't want to introduce more mold spores into the environment than necessary. Uh, that's partly related to the health hazard issue. So I would say try not to spread mold spores um, into the other areas of your collection. And you can have mold uh, identified, but generally we, we just treat all mold as a health hazard. It would be good to know if you had something like uh, Stachybotrys, a really toxic mold. Uh, and you would be suspicious of that if it was on a building material and if it was in a chronically wet area. Uh, basically, I think the literature agrees that chemical treatments are not effective. There is no one chemical that will kill everything. Um, if it's bad for the mold, it's probably bad for people. Uh, but you can remove hypha or kill hypha and uh, deactivate some molds with alcohol. It'll definitely kill the vegetative phase. And this last slide are some of the resources I used. Um, and I will just, this is the, uh, let's see if this works from here. 
Okay. Well, um, I encourage everybody to try the Cornell Mushroom blog. Oh, here, here we go. Let's see if this, uh, because it's a great website. So, and that's all I have, and I'll take some questions. If anybody has any. Okay, wait, let me see. Sorry, I'm a little incompetent here. Let me, uh, okay. Um, I'm going to have to go up to the top of these guys. I see there's a lot of questions here, so let me try to. Okay. Wow. All right, sorry. Um, all right, I see. How do you tell uh, active from inactive mold? Inactive mold looks like dust. Um, the, you can't access these pictures except for as a, um, if you access the archive of this presentation because there are things in my collection. Um, yes, uh, if you can soak the affected paper for 10 minutes in isopropyl alcohol, that should kill um, most of the mold in it. Okay. Let's see. How often do you change the gloves? I change the gloves every time I, you know, I put them on, I work with them, and then I take them off and throw them away. They're very inexpensive. Um, the respirators just have to be 95. I actually haven't seen nine. I've only seen them sold as N95s. Um, when I'm talking about the airflow for the quarantine area, it's good if you can somehow direct the airflow going away from you and out a window, which I, I know can be difficult because not everybody has windows that open. A book with foxing doesn't have to be separated from the collection, um, and it can be accepted as a donation. The foxing is pretty much permanent. And it's usually, it'll probably get worse in a high humidity condition, but it, it's fine. Okay. What do we clean the vacuum with? I would clean the vacuum hose with um, a bleach solution, and I would discard the filter after using it for mold cleanup. Uh, you can find carpet probes. I would just look on the web. Um, I found, they're called more moisture probes. Okay, if the item in the collection is the last known of its kind, and you have to save it, can you explain with the cheesecloth? Um, okay, the cheesecloth and alcohol process, I would, um, let me just get rid of this window. I just take cheesecloth, a good quality cheesecloth, and dip it in um, an alcohol solution. I wring out the cheesecloth so it's practically dry, and I wipe the surface thoroughly. Uh, you have to do it in a well-vented area, and if you're not really comfortable with it, you should probably call a conservator. Um, yeah, the 70% alcohol versus 90% alcohol is a really good question because um, I was first told that by a mycologist, and he said it, be, it was because the alcohol got spread around better, and it didn't make sense to me. But then I was reading uh, Florian's article, and the way it works um, is the alcohol breaks down the cell walls of the um, mold, and then having that much water actually brings the, the alcohol further inside the cells, and so that's why it, it works better. Um, okay, somebody sprayed their books with a water alcohol mix using a plat mister, let them stand and spread it. Uh, okay, uh, I would, um, if you think your books are free of mold, you can shelve them with the rest of your books. I would discourage people from spraying books with uh, alcohol or anything and leaving them in one place or leaving them in the sun because uh, light can be damaging. I would wipe them off and let them dry in a well-ventilated area. Uh, red rot is different from, from mold. Red rot is a decomposition of leather through a chemical process. I recommend you dust your collection as often as you have time. Um, 
most librarians don't have that much time, so if you could do it, say, once a year or every six months, that would be great. I have encountered mold on electronic media, such as CDs and discs, and that responds really well to being wiped off with alcohol. The relationship between mold and dust. I have read other, some literature that says dust is something like 75% mold spores or dead mold spores. Basically, mold spores live in dust. Um, it gives them a place to settle down and find carbon. Uh, mold feeds on dust because there's dirt and dust, and mold will feed on dirt. What I know about thymol is that people used to use it for uh, preventing mold. Uh, I don't think people use it anymore because it's effective for some molds, but not all. I do know people that are, themselves have been adversely affected by thymol, so I don't recommend using it. Um, uh, once again, mold on non-paper products such as film or video. Uh, I hesitate to give too much information because I'm not a specialist in that area, but I think if you're careful, you can wipe it off with alcohol. Do I have suggestions for um, getting um, for get administration to see the problem? I guess if you could, you can do any search on the web, and you will see that um, everybody from you know the government um, rec recognizes that mold exposure is a serious health problem, and um, you know that leads to potentials for loss lawsuits and I think really emphasizing the, the health effects, the adverse health effects of mold. Uh, brand or location about anti-static cloths. You know, um, I would just, any grocery store, like our local grocery store sells them. Is there a certain kind of mold that has? Hmm. I'm not sure I understand this question. Uh, please address sun bleaching or sun exposure to treat mold. Can I go? OK, sorry. Um, I, I'm going to say I would uh, hesitate to, to, um, to use sun bleaching to kill mold because it's really um, an environmental problem. It's not exposure to sun. You're not disinfecting it. Um, so the thing that you want to do for mold is to, um, you know, good ventilation uh, to let the mold become inactive. Let's see, have I got most of the questions? I'm having a little problem with the questions from last year. Why not photocopy or scan moldy items? It's not a problem for the items. It's mainly a problem for your photocopier or your scanner in that uh, the mold itself could be abrasive, and you don't want to spread uh, mold spores around your collection. Uh, is there a certain kind of mold that affects library materials that hasn't experienced any kinds of flooding? Well, any kind of xerophilic mold will um, grow if you have high humidity, and you don't need flooding for that. So you just have to remember that there are molds that will grow in very low, I mean, very high humidity without um, free water. There are also molds that will grow in very cold temperatures, like the uh, mold that grows in your refrigerator. Uh, a medical, just a medical examination is required. Okay, so I did cover that, I think. Um, someone is asking what the anti, yeah, I'm having a problem with, I'm not sure what I'm doing about my question box, but I'm having a problem with it. Um, the anti-static cloths actually pick up mold spores uh, so that you can throw them away. If you just use a regular cloth, then you're, you're, you have a chance of just blowing it around. I see a question on uh, negatives, um, treating with negatives, and I'm really hesitant. I really think you should uh, consult with a photographic conservator about that. I hesitate to 
to give advice on that, um, partly because I'm not, you know, some materials are sensitive to alcohol. And dehumidifiers, um, okay, I don't understand why dehumidifiers would be ineffective for reducing humidity. Sometimes you have to get, um, oh, what do they call them? Um, they're larger dehumidifiers, sort of industrial humidifiers. And it, sometimes it just takes time for um, library materials to give up their moisture. Okay. Um, I'm going to review all the questions uh, after the broadcast, and so if I missed any, I'm going to try to um, answer them at that point. I just saw one question, though, that I want to address, because that's come up in other uh, listservs I've been on. Uh, some people uh, like to spray Lysol on their books to, um, to kill mold, and that's, I, I think that's a really bad idea. First of all, Lysol no longer has an antifungal agent in it, and second, Lysol is uh, in water, so you're really just spraying a lot of water on your books and you're taking the chances of spraying them, of um, increasing mold growth in that way and not killing any mold. So I would stay away from Lysol unless you want to use that for cleaning the shelves afterwards. Okay. I, is there still time to take more questions? Okay. I can take a few more. Let's see. I'm looking for them. Uh, I can take questions for five more minutes. So I'm just going through, see if I'm OK. Um, if a uh, collection has been without climate control for a period of time, is there any other options for preventing or reducing mold growth? I think um, you just have to, you should get an inexpensive um, uh, monitoring device and check and see what your humidity actually is and increase your air circulation would be one way to start. Um, somebody would like more uh, information about red rot. Uh, I can just say that that is leather that's deteriorating and there's really not much you can do about it except consolidate it or put that item in a box. What would microwaving do? You know, I have I've heard about people microwaving. I have not seen anything in the literature that says microwaving helps with mold. And I also want to add, I have did some more recent uh, research. And there's been some discussion about um, oxygen deprivation, increasing carbon dioxide, and uh, that uh, that has been shown to be ineffective as well. That's kind of still up in the air. Um, OK. Uh, repeated outbreaks of mold during the summer, what needs to be done to test the HVAC system? That is, how can you? You can only tell if there's spores in the ductwork by I guess sticking something in there and pulling it out. I have heard horror stories of libraries spending thousands of dollars having their ductwork um, checked and cleaned. Um, now, you don't know that the, the mold is coming from the HVAC system. A way you would find that out is if you actually had mold growing around your vents. If you don't see mold growing around your vents, I don't think you have to assume that you have mold in your HVAC system. Um, I guess I'm not finding new questions. If you have other questions I haven't addressed, I guess I would appreciate if you could send them in some way. Oh, people are asking about freezing. Okay. Um, freezing will kill some molds. On the other hand, that's going to damage your materials. Freezing works really well if you can combine it with freeze drying. That, uh, but that's a, a fairly expensive proposition. If you have um, a lot of wet books and you can't dry them, freezing gives you the time to uh, take them out and work on them one by one. But freezing is not a way to kill mold in books. Um, huh? Well, um, somebody's asking if they should reconsider this as a career path because they're allergic to penicillin. Uh, 
you know, I can't, I don't know if I can say anything about that because I'm not allergic to anything and I don't know how, how bad it can be. I will say there's penicillin, we are surrounded by mold spores. Right now you have, um, you're surrounded by them. Uh, and you, you should be able to uh, wear the proper equipment so that you're not exposed to a lot of moldy materials. I am rarely exposed to moldy materials in my line of work. So I, I guess I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that you should reconsider that, but I think that's really a personal decision. Uh, a list of photo conservators, you could go to the AIC website and they have a link for find a conservator. I think um, monitor, for monitoring equipment, I really recommend um, data loggers because they will send you messages when your um, environment is going awry. So, um, okay, I'm going to answer one more question and then I'm going to, I just really appreciate everybody listening to me stumble over everything and uh, I'm sorry uh, the movie didn't work because it's a great movie, but you can find it if you go to the uh, Cornell Mushroom blog. If moldy stuff is taped up in a box, uh, yes, you can keep it there um, uh, until you treat it. If, you, if it's really sealed up, you know, you might increase the mold growth. So what you want to do is take it someplace where it can dry out and let the mold grow inactive. Um, and I guess I think that's all I have to say. And once again, I appreciate everybody listening.